Hello everybody. I am going to be talking with you today about the book of James. Our scheduled reading is just chapters one through three, but I'm going to be mostly looking at this book overall. And um, James has always been a favorite of mine, um, at least since about uh, 99 or 2000, um, when a particular verse in James really came alive to me. Uh, many of you have heard this story about how I interviewed for a job that I was way underqualified for, and I was just really interviewing for the experience. I thought that I wanted to get interviewing experience, and um, I got the job. So I found myself as the director of a large child care center with no idea how to deal with parents or how to deal with staff. Uh, saying that I was in over my head is really an understatement. Um, I kind of struck uh, out with this, uh, trying to do it on my own, and I quickly realized that that was not going to happen because I did not know what I was doing, and I knew that I needed God's help. I uh, came across James 1 through 5, and it just uh, struck me as being exactly what I needed. Uh, it says, if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives generously without finding fault, and it will be given to him. And so I prayed this verse every day on my way to work. I asked God for wisdom to get through whatever the day would bring me. And you know what? God showed up. Now, that doesn't mean, and I talked with the clubhouse staff about this last month, um, it doesn't mean that everything went perfectly because it really didn't. But I felt God with me during that time. And just as I responded to the daily trials and the issues that came up, it was really only um, how everything took place could really only be attributed to him and just him working in my life during that time. So I worked in that position for about three years until I decided to stay home with my kids. But um, I think as we explore the book of James, we'll see that my experience was really what God was trying to accomplish through the author. Um, the book is all about spiritual maturity, or as our Great Ones Bible study uh, puts it, the life of faith and what it looks like. So the goal of our Christian faith is maturity, right? We're always growing, we're always learning, and the book of James is just really helpful with that process. So we're going to look at the book overall and start by asking uh, questions that a good reporter would ask. So we're going to look at who was James? Uh, to whom did James write, uh, why did James write the book, and then just really how can we get the most out of our study of this book. So the first question, who was James? Verse 1, 1 starts off by saying, James, a servant of uh, God and the Lord Jesus Christ. So there was, there was several men in the Bible named James. And just looking at a few of them, we had James, the son of Zebedee and the brother of John. So he was a fisherman that Jesus called to come follow him and become a disciple. Um, this James was the first disciple to be killed um, to give his life for Christ. He was killed by Herod in AD 44. So he is not um, someone that we attribute the book of James to. There is James, the son of Alphaeus. He was another disciple with really little known about him. Um, we also see James, the father of Judas, the disciple. So this Judas was called son of James to distinguish him from Judas Iscariot. And then finally, we have James, uh, the brother of Jesus. So he definitely seems to be the most likely candidate of this uh, letter. And we know that Jesus had brothers and sisters. We know that one of Jesus's brothers was named James. Um, we also know that uh, James and the other brothers did not really believe 
uh, in Jesus during his earthly ministry. Um, at some point there was a change uh, that it could be when Jesus appeared to James after his resurrection, that that change came. But um, so James became the leader of the church in Jerusalem. Uh, Paul called him a pillar in James, excuse me, in Galatians 2.9. So we know that he must have been um, deeply spiritual in order to gain the um, leadership of the Jerusalem church in, in that short period of time. Um, tradition also tells us that he was a man of prayer. So he, um, we see this, we see the emphasis of prayer in this letter, and it's also said that he has had knees that were as hard as camels um, because he prayed so much. So uh, James may not have believed in Jesus during his, um, his ministry, but he had to have been paying attention because we see that um, much of the book of James mirrors the Sermon on the Mount and many of uh, Jesus's other teachings. So the second question we want to ask is, who was James writing to? James 1.1, 1, 1, the second part, tells us he was writing to the 12 tribes which were scattered abroad. He is writing to the Jews living outside the land of Palestine. So the term 12 tribes can only mean people of Israel. James is writing to Christian Jews and specifically those that are residing in Gentile communities um, outside of Palestine. At least 19 times he addressed them as brethren. So maybe your version of the Bible says something different, but that indicates to us that they were not only fellow Jews, but they were also brothers in the Lord. Uh, Christian Jews scattered throughout the Roman Empire would have some needs and problems of their own. They're going to be rejected by the Gentiles, being that they were Christian Jews, they'd be rejected by their own countrymen. Um, James was leading the church during a really trying time. And um, many, because many of these Christian Jews were still holding on to the Old Testament law. So essentially, James is leading people who were saved, but were still living under the shadow of the law and were trying to uh, move out into the light of God's grace. Also of note, uh, we believe that this was probably written in 49. Uh, this is prior to the Jerusalem Council, which was held in AD 50. So moving on, why did James write this book? So the epistle deals with a variety of themes. Uh, with a very heavy emphasis on uh, just practical aspects of the Christian life. It really could be called a how-to book on Christian living. Uh, some of the subjects that are included in this book are handling trials and temptations, practicing pure religion, understanding the relation between faith and works, the proper use of the tongue and uh, display of true wisdom, being a friend of God rather than a friend of the world, and the value of humility, patience, and prayer. Wow, it seems like a lot, doesn't it? Like all over the place, but all of these things are crucial to the growth and development of the Christian, aren't they? As we read through James, we discover that these Jewish Christians were having problems in some of these areas that I just mentioned. And I think as we look at this list, we see that uh, even churches today are have people that are um, having these same issues. All of these problems really have a common cause. It's spiritual immaturity. James uses the word perfect or complete. It kind of depends on your version of the Bible. Um, we see this used in chapter 1, verses 4, 
17 and 25. We see it used in chapter 2, verse 22, and chapter 3, verse 2. So in using these terms, perfect or complete, James isn't talking about a sinless man, um, but rather just one that is mature and grown up. Uh, verse 4 in chapter 1 finishes by saying, not lacking anything. I don't know about you, but I want to be mature and complete, not lacking anything. It sounds great, doesn't it? But spiritual maturity is one of the greatest needs in churches today. God needs mature men and women to carry out his work. And many times all he can find is little children who are caught up in their own problems and caught up in this world. And I know I am guilty of uh, just being caught up in the minutia of this world quite often. How about you guys? So how can we get the most out of this study? How can we as Christians live the life of faith well? This book really points us to evaluating our spiritual maturity. So we're going to look at five things that are really essential for doing just that. The first thing is it's essential that we are born again. We have to have spiritual birth before we can get to spiritual maturity. If you're meeting as a home group or just talking about this in your family, I don't want you to downplay this first point. Uh, we interact with religious people that are going through the motions all of the time. We have to get real with each other. So the second thing, once we've determined that we are born again, that we've made Jesus the Lord and Savior of our life, the second essential is to honestly examine our lives in light of God's word. Jesus, James compares the Bible to a mirror in chapter 1, verses 22 through 24, and I'm going to read that. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. So we must look into this divine mirror and be honest about what we see. We can't just glance at it and walk away. We have the ability here at Grace to do that with the game guide. Many of you have used this tool through our mentoring program. I know I love every time that I mentor with someone going back through this assessment and seeing where I am. It should definitely not be something that we do once and then we put away somewhere. Continual examination of our lives will help guide us to spiritual maturity. The third thing is we must obey what God teaches us. We must be doers of the word and not just hearers like we read about in James 1.22. It's really easy to attend a church service and hear a message. It's easy even to um, talk about a topic of, of scripture or something that we've learned in our home group. But it's a totally different story, much harder to go out into the world. So to go to our workplace, our school, our neighborhood, even with our extended family, and to practice what we have learned. If we look at chapter 1, verse 25, it says, Whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. So the point here is we must always remember that the blessing does not come in studying the word, but in doing the word. The fourth thing, we must be prepared for trials and testing. Whenever we get serious about our spiritual growth, you can bet the enemy is going to be very serious about opposing us. 
I am so enjoying a class that I'm taking right now called 40 Days to a Joy-Filled Life. Uh, we've talked in the class several times about how everybody should really take this class or at least read this book. It is so great. Um, one of the chapters reminds us that adversity is what molds our character. They shared a quote by Helen Keller. It says, Character cannot be developed in ease and quiet. Only through experience of trial and suffering can the soul be strengthened, vision cleared, ambitions inspired, and success achieved. But we must remember that it's not, excuse me, we must remember that it is how we respond to the difficulties and what we learn from them that develops our character and grows our spiritual maturity. Again, we're taking a look in that mirror. When we face difficulties, how do we respond? Your reaction to the difficulty tells you a lot about your spiritual maturity. Now, we can't beat ourselves up when we don't react how we want to or how we think we should. This takes time and practice and each trial gives us an opportunity for that growth. And just like physical growth, we must work on our spiritual growth constantly. So number five, the last one, is we must measure our spiritual growth by the word of God and not by other Christians. Not everyone who grows old grows up. Have you ever heard that before or something similar to it? There's a difference between age and maturity. Just like you could find a 22-year-old that is way more mature than, say, a 52-year-old, you could also find someone that's been a Christian for 10, 20, 30 years that doesn't have the spiritual maturity as someone who maybe has just been a Christian for a few years. Um, it's just really a good reminder to us that our measure is Jesus and our measure is his word and it is not other Christians. So I hope that as you study these first few chapters of James that what I have shared with you today will just kind of um, help you to look at it a little differently than maybe you would have. And just to really think about uh, why do we want to live this life of um, mature and complete faith? Why, why are we striving towards spiritual maturity? Um, mature Christians are useful Christians. They're people who are encouraging others. They're finding ways to serve. They're building their local church. They're out telling others about Jesus and building his kingdom. I hope that as you and your family or your home group are studying these chapters in James, that you will be able to learn and grow and mature together. So thank y'all.